my teacher friends, Christian Kuhn coming at you again, affectionately known as the Bob Ross of composition. And up my sleeve, I got more gamification and edutainment. So I don't know about you guys, but in my district, my kids will beat me up if I don't engage them. And I'm always trying to scheme up ways to engage my students, but also advance the learning in meaningful ways. So what I have today is another gamification edutainment exercise called What's in Ned's Head? And it's I'm going to focus this one on poetry, and I'll make a follow-up video for rhetorical analysis. So before I dive in, just let me say this quickly. Please subscribe to the channel. It's a new channel. Just got it started called Christian Kuhn, the Bob Ross of Composition. We're growing exponentially. Our numbers are looking mighty strong, and that absolutely delights me. So let me explain the impetus for why I gamify and get anchored in edutainment exercises. Here's the deal. I find that the more multiple choice practice I do with my kids, just like straight up multiple choice, I call it skilling and drilling, I view it as an act of futility. I really don't see their scores augment much at all. I find that students kind of plateau and those that struggle continue to struggle and those that rock multiple choice continue to rock it. So what do I do to bring that middle and bottom up a couple of notches so that they really significantly improve? Here's the kicker. It's not test taking uh, you know, uh, skills. Like I can teach kids process of elimination all day long until the cows come home, but it doesn't really work in terms of improving their scores. And even if I give them a bucket full of other test taking strategies, it doesn't help all that much. What I need to do is this. Here's the strategy. Teach them how to read like a professor. This is one of the staple texts in my classroom. And often when I engage students in Plato's Plato discussions, Harkness discussions, fish bowls, Socratic seminars, I cloak and phrase my question much in the same like parlance and verbiage and sort of sentence stems as the text read like a professor. I really find that this helps students ascertain meaning a little better, but also teaches them the necessary reading skills that are requisite to become good multiple choice test takers. So in terms of organization structure setup guidelines, we follow the original rules of Ned's head, but what I do is I remove all the poopy diapers and the spiders and the syringes and all of that stuff. And I write my questions on a sheet of paper, I crumple them up and I put all the questions inside Ned's head. And then we gamify it. I split the class into teams depending on uh, the, you know, the size of the class. And one member from a team will come up to Ned's head and pull one of the questions out. What I'm gonna do next is show you the poem itself just to demonstrate how to do this. I'm gonna use Rita Dove's flashcards. We'll read it together so you get a sense of it in case you're unfamiliar with it. And then I'll show you the types of questions that I ask my students to help them, you know, get to the authorial intent, those universal truths, universal themes. But the big one is the construction of meaning. I find that most multiple choice questions, especially college board, get to authorial intent and construction of meaning. So without further ado, let's read the poem. So in my class, what I do is this when we, when we break down a poem. I read it the first time, tell kids just to get a general comprehension of it, the characters, the setting, the plot, basic stuff. Second time they read it by themselves and I tell them to go lit terms, devices, technique, hunting. Third time I read it and I want them to get real cutthroat and kind of get everything that they can possibly see. So let's just read it together once so that you get a general working understanding of it. So again, it's called Flashcards by Rita Dove. In math, I was the whiz kid, keeper of oranges and apples. What you don't understand, master, my father said. The faster I answered, the faster they came. I could see one bud on the teacher's geranium, one clear bee sputtering at the wet pane. The tulip tree always dragged after heavy rain, so I tucked my head as my boots slapped home. My father put up his feet after work and relaxed with a highball in the life of Lincoln. After supper, we drilled and I climbed the dark. Before sleep, 
before a thin voice hissed numbers as I spun on a wheel. I had to guess. Ten, I kept saying. I'm only ten. Okie dokie artichokies. Let's question this text. I'll show you the types of questions that I'm going to pose to my students. And this is the exact same exercise that I ran with them. These are the exact same questions that I posed to my students when I gamified this. So going in order here, kind of sequentially, chronologically through the poem, here's my first question. And again, kids will pull these questions out at random from Ned's head. So question number one says, what is the most important word in the first clause of the poem? How does this singular word create meaning in the work as a whole? So I'll kind of talk about my answer booklet here. Um, I think the most important word in that first clause is was. It's a past tense verb. We know from the last line of the poem that the, the student, the narrator, the main character, the protagonist is 10 years old. And was is important because they were the whiz kid. You know, back in earlier elementary based learning, they grasped these math, math concepts. And what it does is set up the, the central conflict of the poem is that now the father is expecting mastery, mathematical mastery, and the kid just can't perform. They're underwhelming their father and they're not meeting the father's expectation. So I like to get into syntactical features like verb tenses. I think it's very important, uh, especially in that first clause. Question number two. The second clause in the first sentence of the poem references oranges and apples. What are these two images hinting at? Here's my answer to that question. So the, the poem reads, Keeper of Oranges and Apples. My understanding of it is this. In early elementary mathematics, you often get word problems that say something like this. Mom went to the store and bought five apples. Why if ate three? How many are left? Right, so you do that kind of math at first grade, second grade, but at 10 years old, like you're beyond that. You're doing long division, long multiplication. So it ties back to the first, the first question, past tense verb of was, right? So those, the, the images uh, kind of accentuate or uh, expand upon the past tense verb of was. So that's where I'm going with that question. Question number three says, analyze and interpret the syntactical arrangements in the second line of the poem. So still, still in the first stanza, to what extent does art imitate life? And I often ask that question, to what extent does art imitate life? Because if you look at that sentence, you know, there's a pacing to it. When the kid isn't understanding the question, isn't getting the questions right, the sentence reads very slow. It's halting, it's truncated. But when the kid begins to answer the flashcards correctly, the pace speeds up. And it mirrors the fact that no matter what, the kid can't meet the father's expectations. The faster they came, the faster I answered, right? So no matter how well the kid is doing, they cannot satisfy the father's high expectations for mathematical excellence. So the syntax captures that in the first stanza. Here's the next question. So we're moving on to the second stanza. The word one is repeated in the second stanza. Connect the imagery to the narrator's characterization, conflict, and what is significant about this number. Well, one is the loneliest number. And you have the image of the geranium, you know, the, the, that one bud on the teacher's geranium, and the bee sputtering at the wet window pane. So what's going on there? Well, I think there's a juxtaposition going on with that number one and the bud and the bee. So correlating the juxtaposi juxtaposition to the bee, the students, you know, in terms of the setting is in the classroom. And like the bee, she wants to get out as desperately as possible because she feels like one of the dumbest students in class, right? So one's the loneliest number and they feel like that isolated alone kid in class, the only one on earth who's not grasping these concepts. So that's where I would go with that question. The next one is kind of a build up to that uh, or a follow through to that. 
to what extent is the narrator being juxtaposed to all three images in the second stanza? So you got the geranium, the one bud, you got the bee, and then you got the tulip tree. And the student is being juxtaposed to all three of those. So the reference is the tulip tree always dragged after heavy rain as my boot slapped home. It mirrors the kid walking home, right? It's not like she's, she's saying to herself, yippee skippy, my dad's going to drill me with flashcards. She's heavy laden, burdened like that tree, right? After the heavy rain. So all the imagery is being correlated to the feeling and the sort of the tone of the narrator. Next question, which character is the hissing being ascribed to? Because that says, before dark, before a thin voice hissed numbers as I spun on a wheel. So the father is doing the hissing. And then the next question is, who or what hisses? And kids automatically say, snake. And they're like, where are you going with this, Mr. Kuhn? And it takes me to the next question because there's a unifying metaphor here. Which character is the spinning wheel being ascribed to? Who or what spins? So unify the metaphor. How does this metaphor create meaning in the work as a whole? So the father's hissing. The father's being correlated to a snake. The daughter is spinning on the wheel. Who or what spins? A rodent. What does the snake do to the rodent? The rodent or the snake consumes the rodent. What's going on with that unifying metaphor? Well, you're ultimately getting to the conflict or the central theme or the universal truth of the poem. And it's that the father is consuming the child with his high expectations. That's what that metaphor does. And then my last question is this. I spy with my little eye a double entendre in the last stanza of the poem. Identify it. How does it create meaning in the work as a whole? So the last sentence is a double, entend double entendre. Ten, I kept saying, I'm only ten. So ten is the guest to the flash card, but it has a double meaning. That's what double entendre means. It's also, dude, dad, pump your brakes. I'm only ten years old. Let me be a kid, right? So it's packed with meaning there. All right. If you want the slides that are featured in this video, you can download them in the description of the video. They're right there beneath you. And uh, you can play Ned's Head with your students. I plan on doing a Ned's Head activity for the 10 most commonly taught poems on the AP literature curriculum. And I'll make that video in the forthcoming days. All right, I'm signing off. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me a line at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. I always respond to my emails. You're not a nuisance. You're not an annoyance. Feel free to drop me any questions that you want, and you can even make some requests. Note that I'm a lead teacher for the National Writing Project. I also have been presenting on a regular cycle with NCTE, Perfection Learning, and uh, doing all sorts of things. So we offer professional development throughout the calendar year. Some are free, some are for a nominal fee. You can go to my webpage, www.teachinghowtowrite.com and see the calendar of our events and uh, stay abreast of my comings and goings. Tell your students or students if you're watching this, I have my own tutoring company. I call it Write at Ivy Write. I'm an expert in the college personal statements and supplements. So I used to work admissions at Brown University. I've also been teaching AP Lang and AP Lit for over two decades. So if you want to get over the college application hump or, you know, really crank good scores for AP Lang and AP Lit, Drop me an email and we can talk specifics about my tutoring company. That's it from here. I will come at you with more edutainment and gamification in videos forthcoming.